All right. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, good morning to those who are online as well. Um, um, let's go ahead and pray, and then uh, we will get started uh, this morning. Uh, let's uh, let's pray. Oh Lord, thank you uh, uh, ever so much for again your word, your truth. Thank you for who you are, and uh, and thank you for what you have given to us. Um, and not just your word, but all things. Lord, um, life, uh, breath, um, uh, again, your wisdom and, uh, and peace found in Christ, um, the hope for the future and uh, our, our eventual uh, reign with him. We pray, God, that uh, this would uh, be encouraging, instructive, and that uh, as best we can, we could receive clarity from what you have given to us in your word. We love you so much for it's in your son's name. Amen. All right, Revelation twenty, man, we are here, and uh, and that means that we are uh, two chapters away from finishing this whole book. My goodness gracious, there's still a lot to cover though, so don't get too excited. Um, and especially in Revelation chapter twenty, there's there's a there's some things uh, there's some things we have to talk about. Um, but uh, we are here, and uh, it has been it has been a good thing. We are talking about the millennial kingdom. This uh, 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 this chapter goes into brief detail about that, and so again we will uh, go through the text and uh, see what type of uh, see what type of features and things uh, uh, that are here. Uh, but before then, uh, let's go into what we talked about last week uh, and our uh, and the pictogram that we uh, that uh, you saw last week very briefly. Um, last week we had discussed, uh, again, wrapped up kind of Revelation 19.5 and the events that, that I believe transpire in 45 days. Now I know that there are some, like for instance, Frutenbaum, uh, he puts all this together. He lumps us all together, 75 days, but I, I, I see it happening, uh, uh, within this 45 day period. Because in this period, uh, the abomination of desolation is destroyed. Enemies of Israel are wiped out. Uh, things like that. Um, during this uh, particular period, it's interval where you have uh, essentially no enemies. Um, they're kind of all done. Um, uh, I believe they've been judged at around this time and they've been executed. And so now reconstruction begins. The world itself is going to get a huge makeover, right? And I would say from the aspect of Revelation, we found all these numbers and we looked at them in the first teaching of Revelation chapter 19 and a half, where 1260 is found in the book of Revelation, right? We have the 30-day uh, interval uh, that's found uh, in Daniel, and then the 45-day uh, uh, interval too as well that's also mentioned, which equals 335 days. How blessed are those who endure up to the 335 days because I believe that's the inauguration of the kingdom. Um, from the aspect of Daniel, we have 1290, which is given, and then uh, the 45-day interval that's mentioned there, and of course the 335 days respectively. During this period, uh, we find uh, the, uh, the resurrection of uh, the saints, oh, uh, Hebrew, the Hebrew scripture saints, Jew and Gentile. At this time, you have the binding uh, of Satan thrown in the abyss. We'll talk about that this morning. Uh, I want to look at it from a different angle. The resurrection uh, uh, of, of, of all the saints throughout history, um, with the exception of those who are a part of the church economy. You have uh, the tribulation saints, the resurrection of the tribulation saints. You have the living Gentiles who are judged as well, as well as the Jewish uh, uh, individuals too, Israel. Um, before the start in the inauguration of the Messianic Kingdom. Okay, okay. so let's uh, let's go into the perspective of Revelation 20. Now, I wish that I could just teach it, and we can go on to chapter 21, but we can't do that. When it comes to this particular chapter specifically, I mean, you would think that, uh, you know, from what we've covered so far... Um, all of the imagery, all of the things that happen uh, within uh, the book of Revelation, the chapter that uh, 
everyone goes to to make their claims concerning the end times is this chapter. There's heavy source of contention, even in uh, uh, from different types of camps and groups that try to make their case from this chapter. Is this uh, uh, allegorical? Is it symbolic? Is it literal? Things like that. There are differing views and perspectives, and there's at least three main ones. As far as I know, there may be more, but there's at least three of them. The first one is Revelation chapter 20 is completely allegorical There's with symbolic imagery. There's nothing literal about it, like at all. Okay? As a matter of fact, uh, you would say that in some respects, we would call this the, um, the amillennial position. And we'll get into that a little later on. Uh, Revelation chapter 20 is partly allegorical and partly literal with symbolic imagery. So some of it is allegory, some of it is literal, um, and there's symbolism all throughout the chapter. And this symbolism is trying to tell us something. This would somewhat be like a, maybe a historicist position or maybe even a preterist position. But in any case, um, some believe that the, it, it, it's half and half, like your coffee. Uh, Revelation 20 uh, is literal or with symbolic imagery. So there is uh, figurative imagery, there is symbols in there, uh, but uh, the, the symbols themselves tell of things that, that actually happen. These things are normative, okay, as far as the explanation. So the big question is, is how are we to understand Revelation chapter 20, verses 1 to 15? Now, I don't think that we have a problem here, okay? But there is individuals perhaps out in the ether who may have questions, who may uh, maybe perhaps look at this uh, from a completely allegorical stance or maybe even a partly allegorical stance um, and make claims based upon that. My position just up front is that I believe that this is normative um, with, the, with some symbolic imagery, and I will attempt to try to demonstrate that this morning. Okay, let's go ahead. Let's continue here. John begins in chapter 20, verses 1 to following, to give us a sequence of events that he details. Now, some of the events we discussed in Revelation chapter 19.5 in regards to the binding of Satan and throwing that into the abyss. But as I mentioned, there are some people that think that this is figurative, that he's not necessarily thrown into the abyss. And we'll talk about that later. Not all the events that happened during this time are mentioned in the chapters of this book, as you all know. Um, we have been making this case all throughout the book of Revelation, going to the Hebrew scriptures, uh, going into some cases the, the, the Greek text um, um, and epistles and things like that. So not all of the events that occur during this time are mentioned in the chapter of this book. However, the ones that are mentioned, the details mentioned here are relevant to the main information that is found within the chapters of this book. Okay. So not all the things that take place within the, uh, within the millennial kingdom are found here. There are other places, and we'll try to piecemeal that together as best we can. John mentioned that he saw in verse 1, Then I saw an angel come down from heaven, holding the key of the abyss and a great chain in his hand. Let's talk about some of the words here. Uh, Kles is the word, the Greek word for key um, here. This occurs six times in the Greek scriptures. Um, it occurs four times in the book of Revelation, which we'll see in a minute. This word is used figuratively in, many re in, in these references, and it's usually connected to authority or influence, some type of responsibility, right? Uh, this word can also use to refer to the person who can perform certain acts related to that authority. Let's look at uh, a couple of instances in the book of Revelation and how it's used. In Revelation chapter 1, verse 18, we read that, that Jesus uh, uses this word in his introduction to John. Um, before, um, in, in front of John when he's glorified. Verse 17, I'll start. When I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man. 
And he placed his right hand on me, saying, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last and the living one. I was dead, and behold, I am for life forevermore, and I have the keys of death and of Hades. It's not necessarily, it's not, I mean, he has actual keys that he's showing John here, right? He's just telling John that uh, he has the authority over death and Hades. Why? Because he is the living one. He is alive forevermore. He is risen to an indestructible life. Death cannot hold him. Um, in Revelation chapter 3, verse 7, we read again the same instance of the introduction to the Church of Philadelphia that, that Jesus, uh, uh, with John writing this down, tells this of the Church of Philadelphia. And to the angel of the Church of Philadelphia write, He who is holy, who is true, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, and who shuts and no one opens. We talked about this a, a while back, that Jesus has the authority uh, to sit on the throne of David. He is the one who is from the line of David, <clears throat> underscored in uh, 2 Samuel and other places. And that no one has the right to this particular key or this authority. He's the only one that has this. Hence, who shuts, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts, no one will open, so on and so forth. In Revelation chapter 9, verse 1, concerning one of the judgments of God. says the fifth angel sounded and I saw a star from heaven which had fallen to the earth and the key of the bottomless pit was given to to him right that this that this fifth angel that sounded this judgment it was given to him to open this bottomless pit by way of this star right and of course um, within the bottomless pit was a uh, a horror um, yet to be seen. Um, uh, the the locust-like creatures. And so we have uh, the, the key of the abyss. So this angel who's come down from, from heaven has the key or uh, to this abyss or the key of the abyss. This is abyssos occurs nine times in the Greek scriptures, seven times in the book of Revelation. There's a frequent word here that's used in this book. And it's used to describe a holding area, either of otherworldly creatures of judgment, or it's the source of a person's destruction. Or it could be used as a prison as well to hold an individual or being. Let's uh, go back and look at this word right quick. In Revelation chapter 9, verses 1 to 2, same text that we looked at previously, we read of the fifth angel sounding, and I saw a star from heaven which had fallen to the earth, and the key of the bottomless pit, or the abyss, was given to him. And he opened the bottomless pit, and the smoke went up out of the pit, and the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened by the smoke of the pit, and out of this pit came these locust-like creatures, right, that tormented men for several months, couldn't kill themselves because of it, right? If you go down to verse uh, chap verse 11 of chapter 9, it reads, uh, uh, the angel of the abyss, this particular uh, 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 being, this otherworldly creature, who is the ruler over all of these locusts, um, these locust-like creatures, whose name is Apollyon in the Greek language. So this abyss has within it these, these otherworldly creatures that will be released during the time of this judgment. In Revelation chapter 11, verses 7 and 8, we read about the beast that comes up out of the bottomless pit. This is not uh, Satan. This is uh, talking about uh, the conqueror and the, and, the, and the source or the origin of his influence. It does not come from above. It comes from below. When they finish their testimony, the beast that comes up out of the abyss will make war with them and overcome them and will kill them. And their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which mystically is called Sodom in Egypt, where their Lord was crucified. Again, the source uh, of this beast 
comes from the earth, from below. We see this also reflected in Revelation uh, chapter 12, 2. Okay. This uh, angel, again, has uh, uh, holds the key to the abyss, has a great chain in his hand. Halos megas is the Greek word. This word, this phrase is only used here in this text in Revelation 20. Um, it is it describes a huge chain, a massive chain, right? Um, uh, that he has. This is not a small, small chain. This is this is a, a large one, right? John continued writing giving us the details of uh, this angel and his works. He laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. He threw him into the abyss and shut it and sealed it over him so that he would not deceive the nations any longer, right, <clears throat> until the thousand years were completed. Right? And after these things, he must be released for a short time. So John continued writing that he threw him into the abyss. Let's take a drink break for a second. Oh, that was you. I should have known. I thought it was Will, but then I, that, that doesn't happen with Will. <laughs> oh, sir, so fun to tease. <laughs> okay, so we see that uh, the, the, the serpent laid hold of the dragon, seized him, threw him into the abyss, the, uh, the abyssos, and shut it and sealed it over him. Kleo is the word here for shut. Sixteen times in the Greek scriptures it is used, and, and, and it is used for just that, for, for shutting someone in, for locking them in, right, for closing something. This word also occurs in the book of Revelation in various places with the same meaning. Then we find that he threw it into, he threw him into the abyss, shut it, <clears throat> and sealed it over him. So this word is sephargizo. Uh, uh, it occurs 15 times in the Greek scriptures, and this is used to discuss either a seal that is set on something, like when someone sets a seal on someone or something. Um, it could be used to close or secure or fasten something. And this word also occurs in the book of Revelation eight times. Right? So it's frequently used here. When, uh, when it's used of sealing, it's uh, talking about the 144,000 in Revelation chapter 7 and the speaking of the seven peals of thunder in Revelation chapter 10, verse 4. Let's look at uh, a couple of usages here in Revelation chapter 3, verses 7 and following. What? Oh, okay. Thanks. Um, Revelation chapter 3, verse 7, uh, to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, he who is holy, who is true, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, right, and who shuts and no one, and no one opens, says this, I know your deeds, behold, I put before you an open door, which no one can shut, because you have little power, and have kept my word, and have not denied my name. So no one can close this. No one can block it. No one can seal this. No one can close this or shut this, right? This is the same word here. In Revelation chapter 11, verse 6, talking about the two witnesses in, uh, I believe, this, uh, the city of Jerusalem, um, proclaiming the kingdom of God, individuals trying to kill them, and the influence and the power they have to essentially cast judgment on these individuals who are attempting to do so. These have the power to shut up the sky so that rain will not fall during the days of their prophesying. 
and that they have power over the waters to turn them into blood and strike the earth with every plague as often as they wish or that they desire. So they have the power to close up the sky, no rain. So you have famine, you got drought. Um, um, they're not able to provide for themselves or grow any crops, right, as a curse upon them uh, for uh, uh, embracing the conqueror during the time the, uh, the Gentiles invaded uh, the Jerusalem and Israel. John wrote that this angel laid hold or seized the dragon and bound him again with this great chain, right? And threw him into the abyss, tossed him in, right? As he was chained up. The dragon is once more outlined and this is explained who it's discussing. Now it's kind of fascinating. Again, we don't have to guess who this dragon is. John tells us this. He's told us this all throughout the, the book of Revelation. Every time we see this this particular description he gives us who this is as we could see this phrase is found in the book of revelation and this goes right back to genesis chapter 3 verse 1 concerning the serpent the ancient serpent was more crafty than the beast of the field which the lord god has made same word used here in the septuagint and in revelation as well and we've talked about that at length. Okay. In Revelation chapter 12, verse 9, again, we get a description of the dragon, right? And, this, and the great dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old, who is called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him, right? So we see a description of uh, the dragon, the great dragon, we also see a description of him in Revelation 12 as well, giving his authority over to the beast of the sea, who is the conqueror. So what does all this mean? It's clear that there are there is some imagery here that is symbolic as you read it, right? But what is the main point of all of this? Well, the point is, is what John saw informed him that the imagery pointed to this angel having the authority and the responsibility to imprison Satan in the abyss. That's all this is. What are the implications of this? We'll talk about this in a second. Actually, I'm going to skip this part because this is, uh, I'll skip that part. John told the reader the purpose of this binding, really, was that the nations will not be deceived any longer. We read this in verse 3. He threw him into the abyss and shut it and sealed it over him so that the purpose is that he will not deceive the nations any longer, right? That is the whole reason why he's being imprisoned in the abyss, that those who are convinced the binding of Satan, there oh, let me, let me back up, okay? So based upon this particular sentence here, so that the nations will not be deceived, this is the reason why he's bound. There are some people that are convinced that the binding of Satan is symbolic to the propagation of the gospel of Christ all across the world. That because the kingdom, because the, uh, 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 the gospel is advancing, they would even put, connect this to the kingdom of God as the gospel advances and as people believe the kingdom is advancing. And as a result of it, Satan is being bound in that particular area. Remember how I told you that there are those who believe this believe that uh, most of this is symbolic, that this is symbolic of, uh, of the, of the uh, um, Christus victor, right? The victory of Christ and the church throughout the world as they proclaim the gospel and people get saved, the dominion of darkness, the kingdom of darkness is being destroyed and Satan, who is the ruler of that, is being bound. There's one such individual who uh, uh, underscores this in what he writes in some of his comments. He says this, he says, while the heathen were in his power, were his servants, the spell of Satan's authority would no longer hold them with the chains of absolute tyranny, 
with the message of Satan's defeat, which went out in the gospel of the resurrection of Jesus, the devil's hold was broken. The length of time for which this condition should obtain was definitely determined with God, though probably not in terms of time as we use it. Essentially, he's saying here, um, uh, this commentator here, is that a thousand doesn't really mean that. It just means a long time. And that, and that this period of time marks the propagation of the gospel of Christ throughout the world and the release of Satan's hold, the binding of Satan due to the proclamation of the word of God, that is Christ and the gospel. A couple of things to mention here about this particular text in Revelation 20 verses 1 to 3 is there's no mention of the items in this passage. That is the key, the chain, the bottomless pit, being mentioned as related to the gospel message in the church economy. The word gospel doesn't even appear here in Revelation 20. Now I would I would I would propose that this is good news, right? That the uh, the uh, serpent of old is chained and thrown into the abyss, so that the deception of the nations would not continue. But it does not say explicitly that this act by the angel is associated with the gospel of Christ being propagated all over the world. It doesn't say that. There's no mention of relative pronouns. That is like or as, as the as the gospel uh, is as the angel coming to with a great chain in his hand to bind Satan and throw him into the abyss. There's no relative pronouns here. There are no there's no allegorical language here either in terms of uh, uh, using the word itself, like in Galatians. And. There's no clarifying words or phrases like in verse two. And he laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan. They, John clarifies the imagery here in this text, like he does with all the imagery in this book, by the way. Okay? We don't have to guess the imagery that's found in this book. John describes it to us as we read it. And the focus of these texts is on the actions of the angel. Notice, there is no speech by the angel itself. There is no speech by John concerning the angel itself. And there is no association or connection with the actions of the angel in relation to the message of the, of the saints. It is just the action of the saints, uh, or I'm sorry, it's act the actions of the angel himself binding Satan and throwing him into the abyss and shutting it. So the result of this binding is very much related to the world and the system that he ruled over being defeated, which is why I place it in the 45-day interval. Because it's not that the kingdom commences and then Satan is chained and thrown into the abyss. No, no. The, 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 the binding and throwing and shutting and sealing of Satan happens, I am convinced, before the inauguration of the kingdom. Because it marks the system that he ruled as being completely defeated. Again, this is aligned with the message of the book of Revelation, that this angel who has this responsibility binds Satan with a great chain, I believe, literally, throws him into an abyss, literally, and closes it, literally. I do not believe that this is figurative or allegorical or means something else. I believe it, it's exactly what it says right here because of the way that John writes. The result of this, that Satan must then, then gets released for a little while. This phrase is micron chronon, literally small time or short time. 
right? We do not know that the numerical time of his release, that is not given to us, right? How long he will be released for. However, I believe it is just enough time for him to deceive the nations once more. We read this in verse 8 of chapter 20, because that's exactly what he does when he's released from his prison, the abyss. He goes out and deceives the nations once again. We will talk about that later when we get there. John turns his attention to another group and then mentions the specific qualities of this group, okay, in verses four and following. Then I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was given to them. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of the testimony of Jesus and because of the word of God, and those who had not worshipped the beast or his image and not received the mark on their forehead and on their hand, and they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. These are the saints in the great affliction who were beheaded, murdered for the sake of the message and their belief in God coming, the Messiah, establishing his kingdom. They were martyred for this. Again, John gives the reason for their beheading because of the testimony or witness of Jesus and the word of God. We actually find these individuals, too, in Revelation chapter 12, verse 9. They are, they are associated uh, in this section as well and following. It says, And the great dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old, who is called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. And he was thrown down to earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. And then I heard the loud voice of the accuser, or and I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of Christ has come, for the accuser of our brethren has been thrown down, he who accuses them before our God day and night. And they overcame him because of the blood of the Lamb and because of the word of their testimony, and that they did not love their life even when they were faced with death. The individuals that live at this particular time, most of them will lose their lives because of these acts. We see the same thing in Revelation chapter 13. I will, uh, it's not on your screen, but I will, uh, I will read it here. Verses 5 and following of Revelation 13. There was given to him, that is the beast of the sea, a mouth speaking arrogant words and blasphemies and the authority to act for 42 months was given to him. And he opened his mouth in blasphemies against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle. That is those who dwell in heaven. Verse seven. It was also given to him to make war with the saints and overcome them. And authority over every tribe and people and tongue and nation was given to him. Verse 10. If anyone is destined for captivity, to captivity he goes. If anyone kills with the sword, with the sword he must be killed. Here is the endurance of the faith of the saints. So these are the individuals who endured or the individuals who have lost their life believing in the message of the Messiah who is coming. And as a result, their reward is that they will resurrect or be resurrected. They did not take the mark of the beast on their head, on their forehead, or on their hand. Again, we see this in Revelation chapter 13, verses 12 to 13, which we just read. That he exercises all authority of the first beast in his presence. This is the beast of the earth now. And he makes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose fatal wound was healed. He performs great signs. The result that he even makes fire come down with, from heaven uh, or, or from earth, from heaven to earth in the presence of men. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth because of the signs which it was given to him to perform in the presence of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image of the beast who had the wound of the sword and has come to life. And it was given to him to give breath to the image of the beast so that the beast would even speak and cause the image of the beast to be killed. And if we um, or the image, those who don't worship the image of the beast to be killed. 
So those who have the mark of the beast, the forehead and on the and on the hand, like I said, it's probably a brand or a scar of some type. Their actions are worshiping this this uh, this idol, essentially represented as the beast, the conqueror. And those who don't will be killed. Then John mentioned the reward of those who were beheaded. Those who were beheaded sat on thrones, giving a, given the authority to judge. And those who were beheaded reigned alongside of Christ. This is the reward for those who have lost their lives within this period of affliction, harsh affliction. They will be resurrected and given authority to rule and reign in this in this millennial age. Again, I believe this is also before, again, the um, uh, before the inauguration of the kingdom, and it kind and it and it transfers right into uh, the millennial age. Now, in the next slide, I attempted to try to give the ruling order of what I, I, I think is going to take place in the millennial kingdom. I could be wrong about this. Okay. Of course, we don't have all the information and I, and, and God has not granted me the grace to see what John sees physically. So we got to go with what we've got here. Um, but again, don't hold me to this chart. Because I, I have no idea what this is going to look like um, um, in the future. But we're going to give it a shot. Here we have the possible millennial ruling order here. You have the Israeli order on this side. And all of these verses we've kind of went through already. Okay, And then you have the Gentile order Okay, on this side. Let's talk about the Israeli order for just a minute. So you have uh, Jesus Christ, who is the ruler of the entire theocratic kingdom. The government rests on his shoulders. He is the one that uh, he is the, the, the ruler supreme, right, in, uh, at this time. On the Israeli order, you have David, who is known as the prince, right, in Ezekiel 34 and 37. Of course, he is glorified because he's resurrected along with uh, his brothers uh, from Israel. You have the 12 apostles who are rulers of the 12 tribes of Israel who will be glorified as well. Okay? And they will sit and rule and govern. They more than likely will be uh, uh, with the princes because remember the princes have their own section if you recall, um, in uh, in Israel, so they more than likely they may dwell there. But I, I would I'm convinced all of these individuals are, are glorified. They've been resurrected. They've been given positions of prominence and influence, and they will reign alongside of Christ. Then you have judges, you have counselors, and you have priests, and the gear are included in some of these. We read texts that even the gear will serve as priests in the millennial kingdom. Okay? Those who were who uh, uh, attached themselves to uh, some of the tribes of Israel, they will serve in that regard. I believe this will be glorified and non-glorified uh, uh, believers at the start of the millennial kingdom. Then you have Israel itself, and again, some of the gear are included in that because, again, they are part of some of the tribes that they identify with. And there will be glorified and non-glorified uh, 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 Israelis as well as those who enter into the kingdom physically. And then lastly, you have uh, the former Gentile enemy nations. Israel will rule over them. Okay. And we see various verses that talk about that and discuss that. Okay. Then over in the Gentile order, you have uh, Gentile kingdom priests. That's Revelation chapter 1, verse 6. We will serve to some capacity. Maybe perhaps we will live in Israel ourselves. 
Christ will give us orders. He, you know, will transport out to different areas and different places, taking care of business, doing different things, uh, uh, being over particular activities, judging uh, and evaluating as well in different cases. You have the Gentile kings, which Isaiah talks about in chapter 60 and 61, respectively, that there will be kings that will bring their tribute into Israel to, uh, to praise and worship the king. Okay, And then you have other nations, right? Uh, obviously there. Uh, this is, we will be glorified, of course. You, will, you uh, possibly will have non-glorified individuals serving and ruling over other nations. And of course, uh, other nations will have a conglomeration of glorified and non-glorified people. It will be a sight to behold for sure. You know what I'm saying? I mean, sitting down, sipping a cup of coffee with a person who's glowing in front of you, right? And it would be a normal thing that will occur here in this particular time period. We will have responsibilities and actions, jobs that we will complete, things we will be doing. John is the duration of time of all these events. Kilios etos is the Greek word here. This phrase is used three times between verses one and six. Thousand, 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 or the thousand. Right. All of these uh, uh, responsibilities, actions, the ruling of, of the saints alongside of Christ for the duration of time is what is known as a thousand or what we would like to say, um, milli for Latin or the millennium. These are those who have, there are those who have different theological perspectives. Like I mentioned before, I wish, I have to do a mea culpa, I wish that we could, I could just teach this and we can go on to chapter 21. But I cannot because there's some things we got to talk about. There are those who have different theological perspectives that believe different things about the millennium. As I mentioned before, there are some that believe that this is all symbolic. There are some people believe that this is all allegorical. There are some people believe that it's partly allegorical, partly symbolic. You know, there's there's a whole bunch of beliefs out there. We will get we will begin to explore those mainline beliefs next week. Okay, and why they are problematic. Until then, grace and peace. That ends my hour. Let's pray and we will close. Lord, thank you so much for your word. It is exciting to open up your word and see the events that are going to take place in the future, especially in this chapter where uh, things uh, uh, will be rebuilt and reconstructed. Things that we've read about, pictures that we've seen, diagrams, charts will all be realized. The things that we're unsure about will become clear. And that will be a fun time to look and see all the things that will take place to actually see Jesus face to face, as well as all of the Hebrew saints that we've read about and looked at to talk with them, to actually sit down and ask them questions about their life and who they are. That this will be a glorious time. I thank you so much for the opportunity for us uh, by John, through John, that you've informed us of how things will be and the justice and the peace that will be experienced and explicated here at this time. Thank you so much, Lord. May we continue to think about this often as we ought to at the hope um, that we have in Christ. For it's in his name we pray. Amen.